Man, the Instagram is just being rough. There he is. What's up, buddy? Just trying to figure this uh, internet voodoo out. <laughs> You're perfect, man. You're all good. Oh, Lord. Uh, so it's going to, there's going to be a lag for a second. So just, it'll, it'll buffer and catch up. So. All right. Just don't be scared of it. It, it usually fixes itself. And Instagram is being a, a complete butthole today. So who knows? Where are you at? Uh, we're in New York, man. We're about uh, 35 miles outside New York City in a suburb. Right. Where are you? Oh. Anybody join yet? I see a couple people on here, but it's it's going to take some time. Like, it's just not – it's not connecting. But it's okay. People will catch on the replay. So, man, it's all good. We can do our questions, and then people will see it afterwards. Oh. The beauty of technology. So, Welcome. Welcome. How are you? You doing good? Staying safe? Yeah, I mean, I just did a... I'm kind of staying home for the next week or so. I just did a couple of... Um, I just did a couple of gigs this last weekend. And, um, you know, it was, it was very difficult to socially distance at the end of the night, you know, when I come off stage and I'm trying to walk through the crowd or whatever and um you know but i whatever i did what i did and i i finally got back to work which was a blessing yeah man. and um and then um you know so i figured i've, I've got to trying to finish up a book and nice. trying to finish up some music for my solo record so I, i'll just stay home for you know a week or so just to see you know, if, if I get any of the symptoms or whatever the deal is, but so far so good, you know. Good man, good. Yeah, that it's 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 so scary. Like you know, we started doing these interviews because you know everything shut down. Like all the teachers within our school were still active, gigging, recording, touring musicians. So all of us are like, okay. And luckily, we've been able to teach a lot online. But it's just been so incredible to reach out to you know professional, famous musicians and kind of. Misery loves company, I guess, because you're yeah, all. Yeah, it's and and it, it's weird for me. Like I don't really, you know, I'm a, a guitar player, but I'm not like uh, I saw you had Phil X on. <clears throat> you know, I'm not like Phil, where I could actually, you know, teach somebody anything of, you know, substance. Um, you know, so it's it's just been it's been a little uh, it's been a little nerve wracking here for me. I mean, I, I I've been. Um, I've been literally out of work since March 15th and I'm getting absolutely shit, shit, uh, assistance from in any form yep. from the government because I'm a self-employed musician, you know what I mean? Yeah. And it's just, you know, it, it's, it's unbelievable. I, I, I just filed an extension for my taxes. I owe taxes from last year. So they, they said, yeah, sure. Have the extension, you know, and, and now it's like, Oh, but by the way, we're charging you, late fees and penalties and interest and so i got that and then about a month or so ago i went for like you know my annual physical or whatever and i used my insurance card and i just got a bill in the mail for like a thousand dollars for like yeah we're not going to cover any of that stuff and i'm like wow, it's unbelievable it's the worst man but we just got to be positive and uh you know we're all in this together. I know that doesn't help, but it, it's 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 what gets me through the day, man. It's hard to sleep. It, it it's rough. Yeah, it's been a little. This year has been uh, definitely a kick in the balls. So yes. I mean, here in Nashville, we've had uh, we've had a couple tornadoes. So I've got buddies that were already set back. They they own bars and stuff, and they were already set back from that. And then there was the COVID thing, and then the riots. And it's just been like one thing after another, man. It's unbelievable. So, yeah. Anywho, let's talk about music. Yeah. Let's, so, so, uh, so we're a music school. We do all of our lessons online now, and I have a bunch of questions I'm going to ask you. Um, personally, I'm a fan. Um, I actually interacted with you sometime in the early 2000s. I was, uh, I was doing some gigs in California, and we played at the Cat Club, and then it was a Thursday. So the Starfuckers played later in the evening, and you sang Helter Skelter. And it blew my mind. I think Ryan Roxy was playing with you too. It was really cool. 
Yeah, that was uh, that was definitely a lot of fun, man. That 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 thing was it was weird. It kind of grew uh, to be this very cool little side thing. It was weird because it was always a rotating cast of characters, and it was it started with Ryan Roxy, Eric Dover, Stefan, mm-hmm. and um, Slim Jim, Phantom. And then, like, if Slim was out doing something, Eric Singer, Brian Tishy would sit in. Um, Dizzy Reed started playing. When Dizzy couldn't make it, Teddy Zigzag from also Guns N' Roses, he would sit in. But it was weird, man. We had, like, some really cool, um, you know, like Jerry Cantrell came down one time and sat in with us. Brian May came in and sat in with us. Yeah. So it, it and then and then the whole band got hired to play some huge party at Eddie Van Halen's house. Wow! And Eddie actually, uh, we went up and we rehearsed with Eddie and we played a bunch of Van Halen songs for his guests. Jeez! With Eddie, so that was uh, <laughs> that was a little weird too, but um, it, it was fun. It was cool. That's amazing. That's amazing. Um, well, that actually that brings me to one of the first questions because. You know, a lot of our students pre-COVID, we put them in bands and we book them gigs. And, you know, we're trying, we have a big jam space in the back of the school. So we try and make it as interactive as possible because to me, playing music with other people is the best part about it. Um, A lot of them deal with nerves, anxiety, stage fright. You know, I'm sure walking into a room with Eddie Van Halen, that kind of has to make everyone be like, holy shit. Like, do you have any tips about how to deal with that kind of stuff? No, you know, honestly, uh, like... you know, there's an old, I, I mean, I know a lot of people say it and there is some truth to it. I mean, I like even, even with me, like, man, about five, 10 minutes, but be- right before I'm getting ready to go on, I still get like, ugh, I get like this weird feeling in my stomach. I'm like, I don't know if I have to go throw up, if I have to go to the bathroom. Like, it's just, I just get nerves. Um, so it's just kind of deal with it, man. You know, it's like, it, it, I think if you lose that nervousness, it's, it's almost like you kind of don't care. Do you know what I mean? Uh, for lack of a better term. Mm-hmm. Um, I, still, I still get freaked out because, you know, especially as a singer, um, you know, guitars and drums and bass, you can change the strings before every show. You can check your cables. You can do a sound check. Everything's great. You know, but with a singer, man, like, it's the weirdest thing. You can do your vocal warm-ups, but until you actually get on stage and do, like, the first song or two, you never really know if your throat's going to cooperate yes. or not. And so I'm always kind of right before I go on, I'm like, oh, shit, man, I hope I hope this thing works. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, you know, so I would just say just kind of deal with it. Take a deep breath. You know, maybe, uh, you know, I know the first song, it's like you get so pumped. You're like, oh, man, I'm walking on stage. And, then, you know, but just kind of if there's any way to like kind of just de-chill yourself and and take a deep breath and then just go out there and test your voice or test yourself, you know, make sure everything's, you know what I mean? And the only Mm -hmm. way you're going to know that is by playing the first song. Right. And then once I, once I'm usually about halfway into the first song, three quarters of the way, I'm totally fine. You know what I mean? But it's always nerve wracking. So that's just part of the biz. That's actually fantastic and very validating to hear you say that because a lot of the people that I've had on ha- are, uh, you know, guitar players, drummers, bass players, very few singers. And um, my girlfriend is a singer. We do music together. She's on here somewhere watching. And she had a terrible uh, injury to her lungs and it messed up her voice. And she deals with terrible anxiety because just like you said, you never know what you're going to get. And a lot of the dudes in the bands are like, just sing. And it's, it doesn't always work that way, you know, no. so... And, and, and it's funny because nobody understands ever, it, you know, there, there's that thing about lead singer disease, you know, LSD, like, oh, you know, every singer's got lead singer's disease. 
But I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that nobody knows the singer's voice better than the singer. Right. And, I mean, I could put a set list together um, for a tour, and I can go out on tour, and I could do three or four shows. But then, it, then it's weird. you got to start making adjustments. You're like, well, you know, actually, that song is really hard for me to start out with. So let's put this one here and you start moving things around. I, I mean, the only person, again, that knows the, the singer's voice is that person, that singer. So, you know, the, yeah, there's a little, there's a little, um, I think all singers, to be honest with you, are a little neurotic anyway, because, again, they don't know whether their voice is going to cooperate. It's your body. It's not... It's not a musical instrument. You know, if a pickup doesn't work, you can change it or resize right. it or do whatever. If your voice goes, your voice goes, that's it. You're done. And, yeah. you know, so I think there is a little bit, there needs to be a little bit of leadway for uh, people with LSD, <laughs> the lead singer disease. <laughs> so. Do you have any, um, do you do like warm ups? Um, are you? You know, the day of a gig, is it a ton of water, uh, tea, lemon? Uh, I, I personally, um, and I've figured this out through experience, um, like, I don't drink at all anything alcoholic before a show at all. Um, now, some people say, you know, don't drink anything cold, drink hot stuff on stage. I kind of think that that's too each person's and you know, whatever. Cause for me, like I'll sip on tea before the show. I'll do some vocal warm ups. I don't really go crazy. Like I'll, you know, before the show, when I'm getting dressed, I'll take a really super hot shower, breathe in the steam. Mm. I'll do some vocal warm ups in the shower. I'll do some more right before I go back on stage, maybe for, five or 10 minutes. Um, and I drink on stage. I drink water and I've been doing it. I don't know why, like every, every vocal instructor I've ever talked with said it's the worst thing to do, but I've been doing it since I was like 16 or 17 years old. I have a couple of ice cold with ice in them, the whole bit diet Cokes on stage. Really? Yeah. A couple diet Cokes, a couple bottles of water and I'm good to go. I, wow. I the so, carbonation doesn't get you? It, no, it it's it's weird. I mean, my 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 voice is kind of raspy anyway. Right. But it's weird. I find like tea dries me out. Mm -hmm. So, I don't like you know, a lot of people say, "Oh, don't eat you know, dairy products or don't uh don't drink cheese or eat cheese." Uh don't you know, and I'm like those are all the things that make me sound better. Do you know yeah. what I mean? So I think it's, you know, it, it, it's weird. I can, again, it's your own body. And years and years and years ago, I, I actually took some guitar lessons. It, it, it's a funny story. I took guitar lessons at a Catholic school. The nun did not play at all. And she literally was, she played piano, but she didn't play guitar. So she was literally showing me how to read music, but like, as far as holding the guitar, she was making me hold it the same way in the picture of a Mel Bay book. So, like, I'm sitting like, like this, <laughs> and I'm holding the pick like this, and she's got me strumming, playing from my elbow. And it was, I hated it. I was uncomfortable. I didn't like it. And I wound up quitting. I just said, oh, this isn't for me. I put it away. And then... About a year later, my mom enrolled me in these classes at, at a school in Philadelphia called Zaps. And I walked in, the guitar teacher at the time, this guy named uh, Jim Noit, he sat me down and he saw how he was holding the guitar and he just kind of looked at me and chuckled. He goes, are you comfortable? And I said, no. So he goes, strap everything. He goes, when you play at home, how do you hold the guitar? So I just kind of, I re, you know, I stood up, sat back down, took the guitar and I held it and I hunched over it. And, and he goes, are you comfortable now? I go, yeah. He goes, all right, that's your way of holding the guitar. 
And after that, like, and and then he, he he did that to me to make me feel comfortable while I was playing it. And then he found the things that interested me in learning. And so he asked me who my favorite band was. I said, the Beatles. Then he started breaking down like songs like Hey Jude or Lady Madonna or whatever. And he would do it in the simplest form that he could just to get me to strum up, strum mm -hmm. down, strum up, strum down, strum up. And he did, it was like, it was so genius. But I've, I, I kind of realized later that you may teach someone how to hold a pick that's comfortable to you, but it's not going to be comfortable to them. And totally. it's the same thing with your voice. You know what I mean? Like you have to find the things that are comfortable to you. Now I, I know people, um, I mean, I've seen people, uh, it, it, you know, here's an example. Like I say, I don't drink before shows alcohol because when I drink, it dries me out and it sounds like someone skinning a cat. <laughs> and, but then I sat there one time I was out with rat and we did a festival with, uh, Nazareth was on that old band Nazareth. Uh -huh. They were on the bill. That singer got off the bus at like 11 o'clock in the morning and he was literally pounding scotch out of the bottle. Wow. And then he walked on stage and he sang Love Hurts and Hair of the Dog and all these great songs. And it sounded exactly like the record. <laughs> and I was talking with him. He's like, ah, man, you, know, you know, he's Scottish. He's like, you know, I've been doing this for 40 years. Why change anything now? Right. And, and so it's everybody's got to find their own thing, whatever works for them. And, but stay consistent with it, whatever it is. Stay consistent with it. Consistency. You know, awesome, dude. That's fantastic. That's good advice, man. That's funny that you learned the guitar that way because that's our whole model here at the school with all the teachers. Like, we kind of isolate what someone is into and teach to that. And I always say to people, music is full of tens of thousands of really strong suggestions, but very few absolutes. You got to make it your own. It's yeah, and you know, it's funny. Like, still to this day, um, you know, they teach you when you flat pick. You know, you strum up and down. You know, use your. And I never did that. I don't know why, for some weird reason, I don't use the pick like a flat pick. I kind of turn it on its edge. Yeah. So, so if you look at my picks, all the edges are worn off, not the, uh, you know, the flat part yeah. of the pick. And I've just, I just kind of scrape them across the, the notes that whatever. And he didn't care that the second teacher I had, he was like, whatever, man, as long as you're comfortable, just that's yeah. your thing. And, 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 you know, and then later in, in, in hindsight, I looked at it and you, you look at people like, um, I mean, Steve Howell from Yes holds the guitar like almost under his neck. Yeah. And then you look at somebody like Jimmy Page, who's hunched over and he's got the guitar almost down to his ankles. Right. And, you know, so to each his own, you know, whatever makes you, but do it consistently. You know, right. and that's that's going to be your thing that, you know, you'll play better, you'll feel better. And that's it. Feel better. That's 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 my motto. I like 20 it. minutes later, John Karabi says, just, you know, do your own thing. Feel better. Nah, dude, I love it, man. Go, go, go as deep as you like. That's what this is for, man. Just, you know, I always say to the people, um, you know, that I'm talking to, I'm like, dude, if you want to tell a story for five hours, I'm going to listen because I'm just happy. So please speak free. Um, on the topic of guitars, popular question here, I'm going to say to you, okay, if you're on a desert island and you could have one guitar, one amp, and one pedal, what would it be? Wow. Yeah. Um, well, I'm going to give you – I'll give you my um, – that's a good question. Cause it would be a toss-up on the guitar okay. between a Les Paul – a double cutaway junior or a telegasser. That's, okay. that's it to me. That's those three are the, the go-to guitars. Um, uh, God, man, as far as amps, um, I think the one man that I, I really loved, 
uh, I always used to use Marshall until I joined Motley and Mick turned me on to the Saldano SLO. Oh yeah. And I used that all through Motley, all through Rat. And then um, I wound up getting a guitar and a guitar endorsement and um, amp endorsement from the same company. It was Di- Diamond Amps, Diamond Diamond Guitar or DBZ Guitars. Mm-hmm. Um, but I still think for some reason that Soldano SLO was probably I, I can't that thing just sounded awesome. Yes. So I would say any one of those three guitars through a Saldano and the only pedal that I use is a tuner. Yes. That's the <laughs> I answer. Use no pedals at all. Unless I'm going for a specific sound, like if if there's a guitar solo with a Leslie effect on it, or you know, then I'll add it into the whatever. But um at this point I, 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 even if I do record a solo with a Leslie effect on it live, um, you'll rarely hear the effect. I just play, I just play straight. I don't use any pedals at all. None. That's sometimes better that way. Cause all the tone is in your hands. You know, you're, you got the volume, you can roll it back and just. Well, and, and that's the thing. Like, I mean, those three guitars have such a distinctive sound. And then if you set your amp right, um, you know, now I may use a pedal like like on my, I have a, a diamond amps and they're great too. They sound great. And it's got, I have a pedal that I have with that and I set my rhythm tone mm-hmm. and then I have pretty much the same tone, but just the volume boost. And then I have a clean tone and it's right. all one pedal. I just hit A, B, A, you know. Yep. And, um, but honestly, I've always believed in using, um, I don't use light strings at all. Um, like all my guitars, um, for rhythms or leads, I use 11s. Nice. And I just let the amp and the guitar do the talking, you know, whatever. I don't, I, again, I don't use... I think it like people use EQs and they use mm-hmm. all this other stuff, but they're using 20 different pedals. And I think you lose some of the EQ, the actual natural EQ when you start running through pedals. So then you have to boost certain frequencies. I just don't believe in it. I just personally, I just, I just want to use the guitar and with a cable into the amp, set the amp in a nice big fat rhythm sound. And then if I may need a boost for a solo, I got to, you know, switch into a little more, you know, overdrive and go. I saw years ago, I saw at one of the NAM shows in uh, L.A. Mm-hmm. And I saw Leslie West do a, I think he was playing, I forget what amp company he was using, Orange or something like that. Right. And I swear to God, he literally, I didn't see any pedals on the floor. He plugged that guitar, he had Les Paul, plugged it directly into an amp, and he had. It was, it, are you there? Did I lose you? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, we're good. Sorry. Okay. He had the fattest tone. And it was weird, like, you know, it, it was like the same tone went into the leads, back yep. into the rhythm, and it was just fat. And I'm like, I've, I've always thought that was awesome. Even, like, you know, back in the day, like, those guys, Jimmy Page, Joe Perry, uh, Leslie West, Mick Ralphs from Bad Company, um, they didn't, they used the Wawa. That was right. it. Yep. And you know what I mean? And if they wanted to adjust the volume, they took their pinky and they just rolled the volume knob down. Right. You know what I mean? It was simple. And those guys had the greatest tones. Man, look, look at Hendrix. Right. Strat with a wah-wah, and that's it. Done. It's crazy because, like, I, uh, growing up, I was 
heavily into pedals and then various gigs I've done throughout the years, I've, you know, needed them to paint different, you know, colors or whatever based on the band. And we had a big gig two or three summers ago, big outdoor thing, a corporate thing. We had to play a lot of different genres of music and I had all my patches and my, and my switching system, everything was perfect. And on the first song, I go on my wah pedal and my foot like kicks off of it and rips the wah pedal off the pedal board and unplugs something. I couldn't figure out what I unplugged, but I lost all signal. So for the rest of the gig, I had to plug straight into the amp. And guess what? It sounded fine. And I was like, wow, I don't need any of this shit. It, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a crutch that you don't need, really. Well, you know, it, it, it's really funny to me now. I'm sorry I'm outside. There's planes going overhead. That's good, um, man. You're very clear. This has been a very clear call so far. So I'm just going to keep saying it's good. Well, it, it, you know, it's funny. I find it really humorous now that you've, you've got all these guitar players that are, they've got 50 pedals and half of the pedals that they're using are just pedals to make them sound like Hendrix or, right. or, you know what I mean? And I'm like, dude, Hendrix was just using like, you know, a hundred watt head wide open through with a Strat and a Wawa pedal. And I don't know what kind of pickups he used, you know, for a certain wind on his on his pickups, but he, they didn't use anything. And it's, you know, again, like you said, it's all about the guitar. It's all about the amp and it's all about the fingers. Right. And, and you know, I just don't use them. You know, I, I like it's funny. I have I have a ton of pedals that I bought over the years and I've tried them. And I got to get my guitar players to show me how to use them half the time. And then I went up not using them anyway. It's, it's, I, that makes me laugh, dude, because like I'm sitting here like in my office at the school and like I'm surrounded by guitars and pedals and everything. And I just got a Axe effects, you know, modeling stuff. And uh, literally it, it, it's, a, it's a Marshall Plexi that I made with a little bit of reverb. I could put every effect and amp in the world in this crazy piece of technology and it's sitting on top of a Mesa amp next to a, a Fender amp, and I made it just sound like a Marshall. I could have done anything. I picked simple. So it, it just yeah. proves the point, I guess. Why not just use the Marshall? I know. <laughs> you know what I mean? I know. I it's know. just. Trust me. I'm scouring reverb for one right now. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm born in uh, the early 80s, and the 90s was when I was coming up with music. And actually, I had Bruce Kulik on a couple weeks ago. And I was saying to him, you know, his version of Kiss is the Kiss I grew up on. Your version of Motley Crue is the one I grew up on. That's my favorite Motley record. My buddy, Bobby Bandy, who I'm supposed to shout out. Uh, you know, we talk about it all the time, man. That one is killer. Um, I liked the way Generation Swine sounded, but I didn't like Vince's voice. And the internet tells me you had a lot to do with a lot of those songs. Is that an okay question to ask? Yeah, I mean, it was, I mean, we worked on that record for God almost two years you know what i mean um now the difference is i'm not a fan of the record that came out right i was more of a fan of the record because you got to understand like we had recorded a bunch of those songs right and they brought vince back then they went back into the studio again for like another year and they switched things around and then they started playing with sound effects and yeah i got funky. you know and i don't mean this in any disrespect to motley at all but the bottom line of it is we did we did a record and it didn't sell well um in per their standards i mean right. it, it went gold but it didn't sell well um the tour was a disaster and i think to be honest with you, Tommy and Nikki and Scott were trying to reinvent themselves to be current. If that, you know. And at the time, bands like Manson, Marilyn Manson, mm -hmm. Nine Inch Nails, um, Rob Zombie or White Zombie. Right. Uh, what's the other band with... Uh, or Al Jorgensen, uh, Ministry. Ministry, yeah. All those bands were, you know, Pantera. Like, all these bands were heavy. A lot of them were industrial. And they were just trying to figure out, like, 
how to be relevant again. And which kind of led to a little bit of my demise. You know what I mean? Because I was just like, you know, this is fucking bullshit. Like, just do what you do. You know what I mean? Just you're Motley. And I've done the same thing. Even after I got out of Motley and I was in Rat and then I decided I was going to do a solo record, I would record a few songs and I would do them and I'd go, man, I got to make myself like I got to be relevant. I got to be relevant. You know, so everybody gets caught up in it. You know what I mean? But the bottom line of it is it took the same thing. It took a manager or a friend of mine to just sit there and go, you know, Crab, listen, man, fuck that. You're, you're, you are what you are. You're a bluesy kind of Beatles, Zeppelin, Aerosmith, you know, that's who you are. Don't try to be something that you're not like, stop looking at trends and just do what you do. There are yeah. people out there that like what you do. And I, and at that point, once I just said, you know what, fuck it, I'm just going to do my own thing. Then I, I, you know, I was a lot better off. You know, but um, it, it, and I think so. Anyway, back to your thing. I, I'm not real happy with the record the way it came out because I think they went so far left. Mm -hmm. Even with, um, I'm trying to think of a song off the top of my head, but um, we we wrote a song that was called uh, it was called Pull Bang. Record. Yeah. And then they tur turned it into a song called Glitter. And like, yeah. if you listen to some of the guitar parts that Mick's doing, it's like this weird random noise, you know what I mean? It's like one song, I don't remember which one it is, but there was a guitar solo on it. It sounded like a chainsaw. And I'm like, well, why the fuck? Like you got Mick <laughs> Mars has got the most awesome guitar tone. Right. He's a very underrated guitar player player. Why would you do that to his tone? So it is what it is. Um, but yeah, a lot of that, a lot of that record was written while I was in the band. And then there was a bunch of other songs that are probably in a vault somewhere that we yeah, wrote. I, I would know. so, so love if one day they put out the demos of those songs, you singing on them. Cause even like the way some of them turned out, like, I forget the names, uh, like the first two or three, uh, third, I can't remember, I'm sorry. Uh, like uh, Flush or uh, some of those other songs, like, I'm like, fuck, like that's, that's you. Like I, I hear it in there, but I don't know. Yeah, there were, there were some songs, we did a Christmas song. There was a song called Flush, another one called Backwash. There was another one called The Year I Lived Today. Um, and they were great tunes. But to be perfectly honest with you, like the, um, you know, I think they were panicked. It was the first time for Tommy and Nikki to actually really produce a record. And to be perfectly honest with you, like my vocals, if they were ever to release any of that shit, I would want to go back in and re sing. Uh, because I, I was so mentally. Like, I couldn't figure out what they wanted. Normally, yeah. when you go in with a producer, if you sing something and they go, well, like Marty Fredrickson, for example, I'm, I'm, I've worked, uh, I've done three records with Marty with the Dead Daisies mm -hmm. and he's, we're working together on my solo album. Awesome. And I'll sing something for Marty and he'll go, ah, that's really good, dude. But what about, and he'll maybe sing like 70% of what I was singing and then he'll just twist a note or two. And, and then, and then I'll go, Oh shit. Like I would have never thought of that. You know what I mean? Right. So the thing that I was struggling with Tommy and Nikki and Scott, as far as producing was like, they would say, no, nah, that's not it. But then I go, well, what are you hearing? And they wouldn't sing me anything back. They really didn't know what they wanted. They were. They would just give me like that these sucks. random. They would give me these random bands, and they would go like Nikki would say, um, you know, something on the lines of you know Manic Street Preachers and Old David Bowie, and then Scott <laughs> would go Cheap Trick, and then Tommy would go like No, dude, like heavy, 
like Pantera, you know, but Lush, like Oasis. And I'm sitting there going, I don't even, you know what, half of these bands I never even fucking heard of. I, who are the Manic Street Preachers? Never heard of them. Right. You know what I mean? And I'm trying to process, or like, how do you, how do you blend Pantera with Oasis or Cheap yeah. or Bowie? Do you know what I mean? It's like, I, I was trying to process it. So my singing was not peak. Gotcha. Let's put it that way. So I would definitely want to re, I would definitely want to re-sing a lot of that shit. Fair enough. Fair enough. Well, I love, I love that Motley record, man. It is golden. I think, you know, when you, when you start picking it to fans, it is not, it is, it is the popular choice. People just know that that was something special and something different. And like I said, my buddy, Bobby, we talk about it all the time and uh, it was killer. And then I love the, the, the union stuff too, man. Around again is one of my favorite songs ever. So it's like, you just have this touch when you get into things, the melodies, while it's, it's, it's funny you say the Beatles is a big influence because you can hear that it, it's catchy. You're great with a hook, but you still have this great rocker kind of voice. So thanks, man. Um, you, you know, but that's, I, I think that's the idea of, of um, taking all of your influences and throwing it into a pot and using all of them. So I love, I mean, I love um, the Beatles, Zeppelin. And, I mean, those two can be close. They're so far from each other. You know what I mean? But I love the Beatles, Zeppelin, Queen, Bowie, Free, Grand Funk Railroad. I love, you know what I mean? And it's just taking all of those things. <clears throat> like I've got a couple things on my new solo record that are very, from a, from a groove point of view, very reminiscent of old Grand Funk. Nice. But then when I'm singing, I'm always thinking of the hook. How can I make this, you know, uh, you know, how can I make this Grand Funk Railroad with Hello Goodbye by the Beatles hook line? You know what I mean? How can I do this? So, uh, you know, it's it's just we even in Motley we called it we called it Motley Stew because we just took all these different things. Mick was into Jeff Beck. And uh, Mick Taylor and all these killer blues things. And then Nikki was into the more punky side of things and Bowie and uh, T-Rex, you know, his thing. Tommy liked heavier stuff. And then I liked acoustic. I, again, I like Sabbath and Zeppelin and all that shit as well. But it was just taking all those things that we all grew up on and throwing it into a pot, stirring it, and like just that. trying to make the song the best that you can. You know what I mean? So yeah, yeah. That actually and ho ho hold on one second. Yeah, Agata, it's a temporary thing. So somebody just wrote to me and asked me when I started smoking cigarettes again. <laughs> it's a temporary thing. Love you, darling. <laughs> Everyone's watching out for you. <laughs> COVID will do that to you makes you nervous yeah. a little bit man a little right yeah um, in regards you know I'm excited for this new record man hey, when's that coming out you gotta well I started recording with Marty and then you know obviously a lot of shit just shut down but I just talked with him this week um, I probably got more than half of a record done um, and then um, I've got, got probably 30 more ideas that I just want to sit with Marty. And, you know, I've got some stuff that I worked on with Richard Fortas. Nice. Just riffs and little song maps, if you will. And now I'll bring them to Marty and I'll go, now what, what, let's, let's, let's finish this up. Let's round it up, smooth out the edges and throw some icing on this thing and call it a cake. But, I like it. Um, we, um, I've probably got 30 more ideas. I've been writing with um, 
uh, Richard Fordish, Kerry Kelly from Night Ranger. Um, I got some stuff, a couple of ideas that I've been kind of noodling around with from a guy named Adam Hamilton in uh, L.A. that used to play bass with L.A. Guns years ago. Um, and then stuff that I still haven't, you know, I started working on with Marty and we still got to finish. So I, I, there's, there's probably, you know, 25 or 30 ideas, you know, so I'm hopefully back in the studio this week and, uh, you know, wear a mask, stay six feet away from each other. Right. And I'll bring my own microphone. Whatever. Right. Uh, you know? That, that actually ties into a question then. Um, you know, what's, what's your process? Like, you know, again, we're a school, we do the lessons, we're teaching people songwriting, I think is super important. And everyone kind of has their own thing. For you, is it the riff? Is it the lyric? Is it the melody? For me, it's the, it's the riff. Um, you know, I'll, I'll just, I'll just find a, you know, a riff that I think is awesome. And then uh, I'll lay it down, and then I'll start scat. See, I uh, start scatting like melodies over it. Um, I really admire people that can write lyrics first and then put the music to that. I I, I don't know how they do it, um, but I usually just, like I said, write a riff, and then and then kind of figure out like, all right, here's the riff. It's kind of like the intro riff, like Heartbreaker by Zeppelin. Now now I'm going to sing, uh, you know, am I going to sing over the riff? From Where am I going? And I'll just start scatting things, you know, whatever, any word that comes to mind. Umbrella, right. cat, dog, you know, horse shit, whatever. And I just kind of map it out. Then I'll go into a studio with Marty and he'll, he'll go, yeah, that's awesome. All right, now let's lay it down. We get a map, and then right. we lay it down. And then I bring the tape home, and I just listen with it, listen to it over and over and over and over again until – this is going to sound really weird, but I've always written lyrics to images that I see in my head. Cool. So I'll hear a song, and then I'll start seeing, like, almost like um, vignettes, like if they did a video. Like, how can I tell this story in four minutes? And so I'll just start seeing like these little images and then I just start s scrolling lyrics down and then twisting them, make sure it reads right. And, um, you know, it's, it, it's, it's, an odd, it's an odd thing. Again, it's to each his own. Like everybody's got their own method of doing things um but for me it's riff first scat just a melody hone the melody get a map and then the producer helps you smooth out maybe some of the edges and then sit down and write the best lyrics you can you know it's funny because i had a friend that i used to write with in high school uh, through college and he was the kind of guy who would always write stuff down he'd like pick up an idea and, and collect all these things but to me I always liked just in the moment what's going on what's happening so I get it I think yeah and, and it's and it's weird like you know I, I just wrote this song um, that I'm working oh it's actually recorded but um you know, you get inspiration from the weirdest things. Like, I'll hear a phrase, um, I'll hear a phrase or a catchphrase, um, and I'll just I, so I do I, I do kind of do the same thing. So I'm always writing things down, or I'm making voice memos, or, or the notes, the note app on my right. iPhone, like. I'll write something down or I'll, I'll, you know, even on Facebook, you're on Facebook all the time. And, you know, there's like some of these wisdom uh, memes or a poetic meme or something where I go, oh, you know, that's really cool. That make makes you think. But, but then there's a lot of times, like for me, 
I'll, I'll just be sitting watching TV. And I fully wrote a song uh, based on, I, w I was inspired by this Netflix documentary that I saw called um, Echoes in the Canyon. And it's basically, it, it's, it's about Laurel Canyon. Yeah. In the late 60s, early 70s. And all these guys that lived up there, like Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, uh, some of the Beach Boys, um, uh, Harry Nilsson, uh, like just all these great artists, you know, lived up there. And like they would go up to, you know, Stephen Stills' house and, you know, on a Thursday night or a Friday night or whatever, and they would all sit around and they'd smoke weed. And then Bob Dylan would walk in or George Harrison would walk in and they would, and I just sat there and I went, man, I was totally born like 10 years too late. And so I sat down and I wrote this song and I, I, I played it for Marty and I played it for my wife and I showed them the lyrics and they were like, holy shit, dude, these are probably some of the best lyrics you've ever written in your life. And it was wow. honestly, I literally wrote it. I watched the TV I wrote this semi kind of folk, you know, Americana, Tom Petty-ish fucking tune. And then I sat down and I wrote the lyrics that night and I went in and I played, showed it to my wife. She goes, yeah, it's great. Send it to Marty. So I sent it to Marty and he was like, this is great shit, dude. This is awesome. And I literally, I think I wrote the song in like an hour, but wow. it's cool. It's called, uh, it's called Laurel. Wow. And the whole time you think I'm talking about a girl, but I'm actually talking about the actual canyon. I you love know, Laurel Canyon. Sorry. Nah, no worries. That's one of the uh, curses of being the guy who runs the school is this is the phone that everyone calls. And I say it's been like three months of Wednesdays six to seven. Leave me the fuck alone, and it never fails. I'm putting out well, fires. It's funny because when I go over to Europe to visit Agata, <laughs> the girl that just wrote to me, um, when I go over to Europe, I tell all my friends and family and everything, "Hey, I'm going to be in Europe for a month, so uh, lighten up on the phone calls." Never fails. I get calls the whole time I'm over there. Hey, dude, what are you doing? And I'm like, God, I told you I'm in Europe. Don't <laughs> call me. Like, why? Are, like, even if, even if I don't answer the phone, if it rings, I'm getting charged. Stop. Right. Right. You know what I mean? It's weird, but whatever. People are wound on their own little train, and they just can't seem to, you know, get off that circle that they're stuck on. <laughs> um. All right. So they're gonna shut us down probably in two or three minutes just because it stops literally after an hour exactly oh. so um before i ask the last question dude thank you so much this has been so cool to get to know you and hear these stories and i'm so psyched for that new record so thank you for doing this for us yeah no worries man and um you know everybody like i said for those of you taking lessons at the school find your comfort zone and just be consistent with it just I go it. i love it uh, the last question I'm going to ask you is, um, uh, even though you kind of just accidentally answered it, um, through all your journeys, various bands, huge stages, epic gigs, uh, huge records, uh, what's the one thing that you've learned that you would say to someone about to go out and uh, start their first tour or go make their first record or something like that? You know, it's, you know, just uh, honestly give the audience every penny's worth um, and, and, and just remember like all those people in the audience think how you'd feel if you were one of them and, like and, you know, don't go on stage drunk because everybody always walks out of the thing. Like, man, you know, so-and-so was, fuck, he was, he was drunk again, <laughs> you know, like what I give them their money's worth put on, give it a hundred percent, 110% and, uh, 
just put yourself in the audience's places all the all place all the time and you'll be fine that's great advice man thank you thank you so much no worries buddy thank you all right brother stay safe thank you i'll be uh following you on the internet looking forward to whatever comes out and uh, hopefully you know when the world goes normal i'll catch you at a gig somewhere along the way i hope so see you all right brother bye